Well, today's a really cool day. Uh, we're going to kind of travel back and make some connections to a topic we did earlier in the year and, and see how it plays with some of our more recent conversations with exponential functions and logarithmic functions and all sorts of things like that. So we're calling it inverses of all sorts. And what we did earlier in the fall was we spent a considerable amount of time finding the inverse of a linear function. But the good news is, is a lot of those same principles are universal for all functions. And so we're going to talk about uh, finding the inverses of a bunch of nonlinear functions, whether those be quadratics or cubics or exponential or logarithmic, et cetera, et cetera. I think you're going to feel really confident at the end of all of this to find the inverse of any type of of mathematical function. So review some of our basics. The process is the same no matter what type of function you're dealing with. Um, if necessary, we're going to rewrite f of x as a y. And then the real key part to this whole process is you're going to interchange x and y, or you're going to switch your x and y, or you're going to swap your x and y, whatever um, word you like to use there. And then once you switch them, all we're going to do is just solve for that new y. All right. And a couple of notational items. We don't we never want you to, you know, hit a roadblock in the sense of um, our notation is we want to be able to read and feel comfortable with this language known as math. Um, of course, as we said moments ago, the, the notation f of x is equivalent to the y. So that's why we're saying we can rewrite f of x as a y. But more importantly, if you see this notation right here, this is read f inverse of x. So it's very tempting to look at that negative one and treat it as an exponent, but it's not meant to be an exponent. It's just a mathematical symbol for the inverse of some function f. Okay, so we're going to start out just graphically in this idea of like, if I've been given f, could I come up with a graph of f inverse? So here's f of x. So all we're going to do is switch the x coordinate and the y coordinate with each other. So for instance, um, the inverse of negative 4, 0 is 0, negative 4, which, oh, shucks, does not fit on my screen. But let's try some other points that we have available. So this point right here is negative 2, comma 1, and the inverse would be 1, comma, negative 2. Uh, the inverse of 0, 2 is 2, 0. Um, right here, you'll notice we have 2, comma, 3, whose inverse is 3, comma, 2. And if I make a bold attempt at trying to connect these dots, not sure what I just bumped there. If I try to connect those dots and not embarrass myself too much. Okay, this we would label it as F inverse of X. Cool beans. Let's look at another graph, a nonlinear one now. So we have an exponential function, and you probably would be able to come up with a decent attempt at an equation. You'll notice here is 1, 2. Here is 2, 4. So if you're sitting at home and you said, by golly, I think that is 2 to the x power, you would be correct. You are the next contestant on the price is right, so to speak. Um, so the inverse, let's start with, uh, we've got 0, 1. So the inverse would be 1, 0. And then instead of 1, 2, it's 2, 1. Instead of 2, 4, it's 4, 2, right? Instead of 3, 8, it's 8, 3. Or let's get a little trickier here. Who do you think this point is right here? That's negative 1, comma, 1 half. So let's try doing 1 half, comma, negative 1. And you'll start to see... Ooh, look at how pretty that function is. This is a very pretty function. Here's something that's worth maybe noting in your notebook. If f has a horizontal asymptote, right, right here, f inverse, which is this function in pink, is going to have a vertical asymptote. So if f has a horizontal asymptote, f inverse it will have a vertical and vice versa. All right, now we're going to get more to the algebraic part. We're going to go back. We're going to review what we did in the fall with these linears and then make the leap to nonlinear functions. So the first step here, as I talked myself through it, is, whoops, don't want the highlighter. Let's try the pen, is let's rewrite this as a y. Okay, step number two says let's interchange x and y. So step two looks like x equals 1 minus 4y. And step three says solve for y. So maybe I'll subtract 1 
and then maybe I'll divide everything by negative 4. And I like to replace that y with an f inverse. So a lot of times what I like to do is I might erase that y that I just solved for and use this notation right there. Now, the other dangerous thing about these linear functions is there's a lot of different ways to try to express this fraction. So we could say negative 1 fourth x plus 1 fourth. And, and that's probably the, the, the most popular alternative right there is we're saying, okay, there's two terms in the numerator and they're both getting divided by negative 4. And that's how I got that expression right there. And multiple choice wise, you never really know which form is going to be preferred. Uh, you just got to try to play the matching game. And certainly if it's short answer, they're both acceptable. All right. So first things first, let's just, uh, oh, look at that fun notation. So we're trying to find the inverse of F inverse. Well, it, it really is not nearly as challenging or scary as it sounds. Um, all we're going to do is just work our way backwards to F. So the inverse of F inverse is just f. And uh, the process is the same. We're going to switch x and y, but first let's rewrite this as a y. We're going to then interchange x and y. So even though it looks scary, it's basically the exact same process. We're going to subtract that 2 over. We're then going to divide everything by negative 3. This would then be named f of x. And if you wanted to divide both terms in the numerator by negative 3, more power to you. Cool beans. Okay, so here's our first nonlinear function, and you'll notice this is a cubic function. But the script is the same, folks. So let's just rewrite this as a y. We're going to go ahead and interchange x and y. And now we just got to solve for y. No biggie, right? We'll add the 3 over. And then here comes a really fun move. We're going to take the cubed root of both sides. And there's your inverse function right there. We just basically undid each mathematical operation one at a time. Now, before we go any further, let's just review converting from logarithmic to exponential and vice versa. So when starting with a logarithmic, what I like to do is go around the world. So I want you to circle your base. We're going to go the long way. So two raised to the y power is equivalent to the quantity 2x plus 4. 2 raised to the y power is equivalent to 2x plus 4. Um, in our second example, circle your base. That raised to the 3x is equivalent to 8. So we could say the quantity y minus 2 raised to the 3x power is equivalent to 8. Now, that was the easy part for me. I don't know which way you prefer. Um, I prefer to start logarithmic and then convert it into exponential, but it is possible to do just the opposite and kind of reverse engineer that process. And it all starts with that common language. This is your base, okay? Just like in the last example, y minus 2 is your base here, and it was your subscript or your base over here. 2 is your base in the exponential form, and it was your subscript in the logarithmic form. So whoever that base is is going to be your subscript. So I know it's going to be log base 4. And in this case, it's of y equals x. Um, the, the value over here that you set your log equal to will always be the exponent um, from that exponential form. If you have any doubts whatsoever at this stage of the game, all you got to do is go around the world, take your 4, raise it to the x, set it equal to y, and it matches this guy. So a lot of times when I do think I converted it into log form, I'll go ahead and just as a double check, I'll go around the world to see if it matches up with the original exponential function. Okay, so again, let's do this. Start with your base. So I know it's got to be, um, I know it's got to be log base eight. And this time it's going to be of y equals the exponent, which is the quantity x plus four. All right, next example here. Who's your base? Your base is 3b, so that's going to be your subscript. Log base 3b of n equals the exponent. And it's as easy as that. So let's go ahead and see how that's going to help us today with finding the inverses. So we're following our same game plan. We're just going to take this f of x and rewrite it as y. We're going to interchange the x and the y. Okay, and then make a note right here in your notebook. We're going to convert from exponential form 
into logarithmic form. So what we just did is we said, okay, here's your base, right? So we're going to say log base 3 of x and then set that expression equal to the exponent, which was y. And again, like we said earlier with those other functions, we said if you want to be real uh, fancy, we could replace the y with an f inverse notation. And there is your function. In a general sense, the inverse of an exponential function, like this guy, will always be a logarithmic function, like this guy, and vice versa. Okay, very similar, just a tick harder. Um, let's rewrite that f of x as y. Step two says we're going to interchange. And then um, if you want to make a note here again, we're going to convert from exponential to logarithmic. How about that? So we're going to say log base 4 of the x equals the quantity y minus 3. And then all we got to do is just add the 3 over. Now, what you could have done when you added the 3 over, you could have said log base 4 of x plus 3 equals y. But what I would have done in that case is I might have put a parenthesis around the x just to accentuate the fact that we're only taking the log of x and the plus 3 is not involved in that, that logarithmic term. So that's why I preferred to put the 3 to the left of the log there. All right, so let's flip the script. What if we start with a log function? A couple of hidden gems in this question. So first of all, let's just rewrite this as a y. And then we're going to interchange those variables. Notice nothing else moves, nothing else changes. It's just you're swapping your x and your y with each other. Now, there is a log property hiding right underneath our nose. And it's this idea that this 2 can transform into the coefficient. So, and I've got to multiply the two and the three, which is going to make ourselves a really nice six. And one thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to isolate this logarithmic expression. So I'm going to divide by six. You're like, well, how did you know that, Mr. Hill? How did you know we should divide by six? Well, if you think about this, you're solving for y and you're trying to undo all of the mathematical operations that are in play. And so what I noticed here, that it, I had multiplication, six times log of y. How do you undo multiplication? Well, you just divide it, right? Okay, now, if you wanna make a note in your notebook here, we are gonna convert from logarithmic into exponential, right? You're like, whoa, wait a minute, how are you gonna do that? Remember, there's an invisible subscript of 10 so we're going to go around the world. We're going to start with our 10. We're going to go the long way and raise 10 to the x divided by 6 power and then set that equal to the quantity y. So it all look like this. 10 raised to the x divided by 6 power equals y. And if you want to get fancy, you could rewrite that as f inverse of x. And ladies and gentlemen, that is 1 great inverse function. We've got one more example and we saved the big bear for last. This is an example of a rational function. In other words, it's the quotient of two simple polynomials. And these are always, I think, the hardest ones to find the inverse of, but let's just trust the process and see what happens. So we'll rewrite that as a y and then we'll interchange so we got y plus 1 and y minus 1. Now, what makes this one so wild is you've got more than one y, okay? Um, so it's going to make it a little wilder to solve for y. But what I'm going to do is just cross multiply. And I'll get x distributed through the quantity y minus 1. And then here's a key. Let's write this in our notebook. We're going to collect all terms with a y on one side. So what I want to do, and then vice versa, collect all the terms that don't have a y on the opposite side. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this y and subtract it to the left side. 
And then if you're comfortable with this, at the same time, we'll take this minus x and add it to the other side. So ultimately, it's going to be xy minus the y from the left equals x plus 1. Now, here's another monster move coming up here. And we'll put another asterisk in a note. We are going to factor a GCF, whoops, C, GCF of Y out of the left side. So it'll look like this, Y quantity. So that first term turns into X, and that second term turns into a minus 1 once you divide it out. And then last but not least, we're going to divide both sides by the quantity x minus 1, leaving you with y equals x plus 1 over x minus 1. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what just happened? Um, isn't that the same as the original function? Well, this happens every once in a blue moon. Now, this won't happen for all rational functions, but every once in a while, a function will be its own inverse. And uh, basically what we're saying is if you graphed it and then you try to reflect it over the line y equals x, which is that diagonal line that cuts through the first and third quadrants, the, the reflection would land right on the original function itself. And so there are a few functions, uh, real special ones, where this happens. And this just happens to be one of them. Uh, but like I said, don't assume that this will happen for all rational functions. This is just a very special case.